All right, so find your way to Jeremiah 9, uh, 9 and 10 tonight as we go through this study, a couple chapters. Uh, remember the time frame of Jeremiah. So here we are opening up an ancient book, right? That's okay to open up an ancient book when you know the source, when you have that which God gave by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit inspires these, these men who wrote down these scriptures, uh, 40 different men or 40 different authors, if you will, or if you prefer, 40 different pens. The, the real author is the Holy Spirit as uh, these things are written down. Now, why would God send a prophet to speak to his people Israel? Well, in Jeremiah's day, they hadn't been listening to what God had given them in the Bible, or in, in that case for them, it was the Torah. And in, in Jeremiah's day, they would have had the Psalms of David. They would have had the writings of Solomon. So they had these things, uh, but they were not put together yet. They were not put together until Ezra probably compiled uh, the books of what we call the Old Testament. So you and I need to have an understanding that in the day and age in which we have the Bible, and then we open up to uh, an old part, um, well, it's all old, but Jeremiah would have lived about 600 years before Christ, uh, actually 650 to 600 years before Christ. And so as he's writing these things down, he's prophesying. Remember that there were two kingdoms. There was the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. They, they had their own civil war. They, they split the kingdom in the days of uh, immediately following Solomon. And at this point when Jeremiah is prophesying, he is prophesying because the southern kingdom of Judah is gonna go the same way as the northern kingdom of Israel, and they've already been carried over by a foreign king. Now, understanding the Bible doesn't have to be that difficult. It was for me at first because I hadn't read it. What a, what a novel idea that uh, not having read the Bible that I didn't really understand how things fit together and then about the, the second time through, reading through the entire Bible, began to see that God had chosen his people Israel, and much of what we call Old Testament is God's dealing with Israel and the various, if you will, big events of their history. You, you know that they had 400 years as slaves down in Egypt, and uh, that uh, prior to that, God had called this man Abraham out of all the people on the earth. He, he, he called Abraham, and he gave him certain promises, which included uh, land and then promises of descendants, of which Abraham had a son named Isaac, and Isaac had a son named Jacob, and then Jacob, after wrestling with God, was renamed Israel. And so starting to understand how the children of Israel, again, they started out 70, went down into Egypt. 400 years later, they come out almost 2 million, and then they're brought in to actually receive that promised land uh, in the days of Moses. And then in that promised land, they dwell about 400 years being ruled by God uh, and God appointing different judges. And then they go on and ask for a king. And in asking for a king, it goes for about another 400 years under the king. So you had Saul, and then you had David, and then you had Solomon. So after the third king, then the kingdom split into two. Well, by the time Jeremiah is prophesying, we are well advanced into this time period of the kings, so much so that that. Jeremiah is prophesying that the end is coming. Now, I don't know if you've ever uh, seen on TV, this has been going on for, for, well, since the 60s, you'd have some guy with, you know, this big hair with a sign coming up, say the end is coming, right? You'd, you'd, you'd see these things in the, in the culture played out in regards to this understanding that the end of the world is coming. Now, as we've studied on Sundays going through Revelation, remember that prophecy, and we looked at the prophecy of Armageddon and how Armageddon is not synonymous with the end of the world, but Armageddon is a place where all the nations of the world are going to gather together to fight against God and against Jesus Christ. So as we enter into the days in which we live, looking at writings of Jeremiah a long time ago, uh, tonight's study is entitled, Is the Truth Gone? And in this study, I, I find some interesting parallels. Here's why. See, in Jeremiah's day, Jeremiah was sent to prophesy unto the people that the kingdom of Judah was going to be overtaken by the Babylonians, and it meant destruction, it meant death, it meant captivity, it meant being dispersed to the other countries of the world. Now, when I say it in that context of why it's similar, is the Bible has revealed that, that we live in such a time in that things are not 
continuing as they always have continued. That's, that's uniformitarianism. Not true. God is into dispensations of time. Meaning that if you plop down here in 2017 and you study history and you would say, well, it's always been this way. And yet the Bible, which came before mankind, is the only account of God creating the heavens and the earth. And when you see that God in, in his word has revealed the beginning, he's revealed the end, and then he's revealed in this thing what I call predictive prophecy that he has written these things down ahead of time that you would know that he is God, let alone to talk about the miracles that are recorded. And let's, let's just go right to the big one, which was the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, as we enter into this study of the one who created all things, we know that his people, Israel, uh, didn't listen to him. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be surprised about that. How much more important it would be today that we as the church, again, the church is Jesus' assembly. It's those that are saved from sin and death through faith in Christ Jesus, born from above, and they're called out of the world and then called to belong to Jesus' assembly, called the church, and we're told to listen to him and serve him and follow him and love him. And by the way, he's really, really good. Uh, and so when you grasp what we're looking at here, my whole thing for you in this study tonight is the truth gone. Well, the context of chapter nine, we can begin right there in verse one. It says, oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go from them, for they are all adulterer, adulterers and assembly of treacherous men. Well, we find out in the context coming out of chapter 8, just glance at verse 18 of chapter 8, and it says that he would comfort himself against sorrow, if he could. And you see that Jeremiah was given a prophecy that Judah is going to be destroyed, and it means that there are those going to be killed. Now, you'll notice Jeremiah is not taking pleasure of bringing the bad news and say, finally, those sinners are getting what they deserve. In fact, quite the contrary, you'll see here that all this language is that he has sorrow. Now, the word sorrow uh, is to be grieved in affliction and have sorrow. He says that my heart is faint in me, means that he is troubled and he's sick to his stomach. Now, when we've studied Revelation over the last several weeks and, and looking at the end of when God is going to judge this world for their sin and their wickedness and, and mankind has refused to repent and, and then they, they choose this, this world leader who leads them into worshiping Satan and all these things, uh, it should make us sick to our stomach to consider how hardened men's hearts had become that they would resist these things of God. Jeremiah's prophesying, and he says, the hurt of the people and so you see that in 21 of, of chapter 8. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt, I am black, astonishment hath taken hold of me. And he says, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? So they're not healed. Well, we find out that he is weeping and crying and regards to the prophecies given that many are going to be slain. In fact, he goes right to the issue. He says, many of the daughters of my people are going to be killed in this judgment. Now, in verse 3, it says, and they bend their bow. So speaking of their adultery and their, and their sinfulness, um, not a very pleasant topic in 2017 to actually talk about the sinfulness of mankind. Not too popular in churches anymore because if you start talking about sin and you talk about wickedness, and then the, the implication is that God is going to do something about all those uh, disobediences. And the Bible does reveal that this is happening. So many in desiring to have a pleasant sounding message have sectioned off the scriptures and no longer talk about what the Bible reveals as sin and disobedience. And they only talk about the love of God and, and that God is there to make you feel better and that, that somehow if you, if you can capture this part, God can help you have a nice day every day. Now, I don't want to be too sarcastic about that because I realize that the, the situation that we're living in, if you can jump into this study with me, it really begins for me in verse 3 of chapter 9. Speaking of the people who lived in the culture and society, it says, they bend their tongues like a bow for lies. 
So the tongue is the bow, the lies are the arrows. This is the description he, uh, he says. But they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. Take ye heed every one of his neighbor, and trust ye not in any brother, for every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders, and they will deceive every one his neighbor, and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies, and weary themselves to commit iniquity. Now, iniquity is, is general wickedness. And so you'll, you'll see how this is playing out in the society and the culture of Jeremiah's day. Thine habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will melt them and try them. For how shall I do, I do for the daughter of my people? Their tongue is like an arrow shot out. It speaketh deceit. One speaketh peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but his heart he layeth his weight. Well, in looking at the consideration of this, and I don't know if anybody saw this or you pay attention to Time Magazine or not, but uh, this, this spring they put forth a commemorative cover which commemorated something they put on their cover 50 years ago. And 50 years ago, in 1966, they put on their cover, Is God Dead? And now in 2017, and I think it was an April, March or April issue, they said, Is Truth Dead? Now, when we consider the world in which we live in, and, and if any one of you are actually thinking you're getting truth through the media, you would be self-deceived to actually think that anyone would be giving you truth. Now, when we come to this and what Jeremiah was sent to prophesy of this, and look where he begins to prophesy concerning what's the problem, what's the sin of the people, again, in this case, the people of God. So here as the church, we should not think, well, it's, it gets none of this us and them kind of thing. It's more like a, if we're not careful, this is a we and this, this is the practice. So to sum this up for you, lies and deceit in the earth, not valiant for the truth. I mean, there was a time when, when there was a real pursuit of saying, I want to know the truth. I want to, will you tell me the truth about this issue? Will you tell me the truth about where this came from? Will you tell me the truth? And, and that's missing in our culture and society as much as it was in that day and age. Now, it says they proceed from evil to evil. Now, so Pontius Pilate asks a question to Jesus. What is truth? Because Jesus had said to him, I came to bear witness of the truth. Pilate says, what is truth? You have your truth, I have my truth. Oh, that's more what they say nowadays. There is no absolute truth. Who ever said that there was no absolute truth? And they say that absolutely. Because what if they're lying? Well, they are lying. Again, from evil to evil, and they, they know not the Lord. Underline that. Somehow get that into your heart. The issue at hand here is if there is no truth, and that's the whole point of that Time magazine cover, is God dead, 1966, 50 years later, is truth dead? It's this whole issue of is there truly a God or not? Is it, is it true? And the issue there is that they know not the Lord. Now, try this on for size, because I did earlier today, and see if you like it or not. The very issue when lies infect the culture, it comes right into the closest relationships, so that there is no trust so trust is lost in the close relationships. Brothers and neighbors supplant, slander, and deceive. Now, I don't know if there ever was a day when, when you were making a deal with someone where you would, you would seal it with your word and a handshake. Now what do you do if you're in business in order to protect yourself? You hire lawyers to write you contracts so that the person you know that you're going to make a deal with is going to actually try to take advantage of you. And if, and if you make a mistake, I worked for a boss like this one time, and, and since I was in accounting and I was, and I was responsible for making sure everything was done accurately and balancing, and if, if we ever made too much money on an item or too little money on an item, I knew something was wrong either on the books. I would be looking for theft. I would be looking for, get this, simply missing sales transactions. Well, in uncovering one of these mistakes, it was several thousand dollars that was actually miscalculated in the value of some uh, commodity that we were purchasing from a farmer, and the check had been written to, written to him, and I went back and calculated all the numbers. Turns out we owed him some 8,000 more dollars. Now, when I, I was not the one writing the check, but I caught the mistake, and so I recalculated it. I triple-checked my work, and then I, and I did all the work, and then I wrote the check, and then I sent it in the mail, and then I went and told my boss. Do you know why? 
Because if I said to him, hey, I just found an $8,000 mistake, the first words out of his mouth would be, is it in our favor? Or is it, you know, so, so the, the, the incident in the closest personal things, and it goes right into the house, it goes right into the relationships. Listen to this phrase out of this section. Will not speak the truth, lies come off their tongues, they refuse to know the Lord. Now, the whole issue at hand is they know not the Lord, so what is truth? You, what, what's wrong with lying? Why, why bother with this, you know, thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor? Wasn't that one written by the finger of God in stone? And yes, it was. And then this phrase, they refuse to know the Lord. Now, today, mankind is crying out for, I want my own way. The whole globe over, I want my own way. Verse nine, what, I say to you, what should God do about the disappearance of the truth amongst his people? What is true anymore in church? Well, verse nine, shall I not visit them for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? For the mountains will I take up weeping and wailing for the habitations of the wilderness, a lamentation. Because they are burned up so that none can pass through them, neither can men hear the voice of, of the cattle, both of the fowl of the heavens and the beast are fled, uh, they are gone. And I will make Jerusalem heaps and a den of dragons, and I will make the cities of Judah desolate without inhabitant. Now, I don't know if you like being the bearer of bad news, but here Jeremiah was sent by God. Remember, he was called before he was in the womb. He said, God said to him, I knew you, I formed you. And then he appointed him to go and speak these things, and not just to that nation, but we're studying what he gave to the nation of Judah, to God's people, and he's going to speak to the other nations as well, and he's going to give these truths. He is prophesying of their desolation. He's prophesying that they're going to be destroyed. And as he brings that message, and he talks about weeping and wailing, and that's why Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. So he, was, he brought judgment Right? He brought the word of judgment and it affected his heart so much that he would realize that there would be people killed and taken into captivity and they would be destroyed for their disobedience. Now, verse 12. Who is the wise man that may understand this? Now, here's the challenge for the day and age in which we live. I mean, we, <clears throat> we have men prophesying by their own understanding words and things <clears throat> Oh, I need some water. All right, you can grab me some. Um, prophesying by their own words and things, the various date setting of this is the end of the world. Do you realize that this whole thing about the end of the world is coming, that the end of the world is near? And we went through one in September, like somehow the rapture of the church was going to be on September, what was it, 21st or 22nd? And then the guy said, well, it's going to happen in October. I have not even paid any attention to it because I know that Jesus said no man would know the day or the hour in which the Lord would be doing these things, let alone for us to have the perspective that somehow just one day that, that the, the world is just going to cease to exist. Thank you. Uh, that the world would just all of a sudden cease to exist when the Bible has prophesied that these various things must take place. So who is wise and understanding in 2017? Who, who's paying attention to, to look upon the, the scape of humanity and the landscape of what's happening in history, understanding the past, and, and who's actually inquiring of the right one who knows the beginning of all things and who knows the end of all things and then has actually instructed us how we are to live? Who is, who is that man who may understand this? Who is he? to whom the mouth of the Lord hath spoken that he may declare it. Now that was Jeremiah in that day. Now I am not looking for a prophet to the nations. I am not looking for a prophet to America. I am not looking for anyone to come and, and somehow have this prophetic voice that everybody's going to listen to. Now in the sensationalism of prophecy, guess what you can find on the internet and you can find the books. If you want to spend all your money chasing down this sens sensationalized, you know, prophecy like some of the guys got some kind of secret viewpoint of all this stuff you could you could blow all your money chasing these things down or you could do something very wise and understanding you could open your bible you could read and you could ask the lord to teach you what he has already given in his word concerning the days that are yet to come well in that day jeremiah was sent the land perished burned up like a wilderness that none may pass through verse 13 the lord saith 
because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice. Now, can you appreciate with me that God has set forth his ways, his righteousness? If you want to know what is right and true, all you have to do is examine the life of Jesus of Nazareth and understand that in his righteousness he sinned not, and in his resurrection from the dead, revealing that he is Lord, and that that judgment upon the cross concerning his death was not for himself. It was for the sin of the world. And when you see that, that uh, those had not obeyed his voice, neither walked there in his ways, in verse 13, but have walked after the imagination of their own heart. Now what has been happening all throughout this world? There's been a changing of that which is moral, what is right and true according to God's ways. The one, well, who is God anyway that he should speak to us? See, isn't that the mentality of like, well, I was, I was born this way or I feel this way. I self-identify. Now, one of my favorite ones of self-identifying, I like to make a joke about it because I think self-identifying is just another way of saying God, made, God, God makes mistakes and he doesn't. And so we were at the, the gym and they were doing an open enrollment for senior citizens could sign up for free at the gym and they didn't have to, and they had reduced fees. And I came in the gym and they'd say, I self-identify as an old man today so I can get cheaper prices. And they kind of looked at me and then they caught on with what I was saying. Uh, but you and I need to understand this. Have not obeyed the voice, haven't walked in his ways, have walked after the imagination of their own heart. Well, let's just take... What is, what is God's definition of marriage? Well, he says, in the beginning, God made them male and female. Male and female created he, them, right? And he says, for this reason, for this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and the, the shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. And that's what he gave in the beginning. And now this imagination of everyone's own heart, this is not new. What were they doing in Jeremiah's day? It says that they were following after Ba uh, the Baals or Baalim, that's plural for the worship of the gods of the Canaanites who were there before them. You mean to tell me they were worshiping the gods of this world? Yeah. And then it says, where did they learn that? Well, from their fathers. That means that, that this had always been going on. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood or, or bitterness and give them water of gall to drink. And he says, I'll scatter them amongst the heathen. Well, what should God do? If you are going to make a good consideration, is it a moral act to kill unborn babies? Is that a moral act? Now, you have to make a decision about that, and, and this, is a, this is a very important understanding that that's, that's just one thing that goes on, and then to see that when is it moral or immoral to do any of these behaviors? Well, what should God do when he finds that, that his people no longer walk in his ways? Shall he not visit his people? Uh, I don't think this is a visit where God's going to come knocking on the door and come in and, and dine with them. He's going to come and bring correction. Now, there's prophecy that he will visit and avenge his people for their ways. Now, prophecy's importance to today's living. I just kind of get your attention over this issue. Prophecy's importance to today's living. Well, we find out, Revelation 1-3, that there is a special blessing for those who read. 1-3, uh, blessed are he that readeth and they that hear the words of the prophecy, again, of the book of Revelation, and keep the things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. The time is at hand, and it was written 95 AD. If the time was at hand then, and then now as time continued, we're still under this same dispensation of time. So there's wisdom from God, understanding from God, hearing what God has said, and then declaring it to others. That was Jeremiah's task. And we see that this, these things that are written down, and to ask a simple question, why is this happening? You know what mankind is saying today? It's saying it's God's fault. Why would God do this? God wouldn't do that, and the people have presented God completely opposite of how God has presented himself. And here we are, in, if we understand the judgment that is coming upon this Christ-rejecting world, that when the church is going to be raptured out and God is going to uh, finish and complete his seven years of prophecy for Israel, and that the Antichrist, Satan's man, Satan's going to literally possess another man here on this earth, and that man is going to rule the world, a global world leader who is going to demand that he's worshipped as God in the Holy of Holies in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. And as he does that, it's going to cause an uproar for the Jews, for Israel. They're going to flee out of Jerusalem. And then 
the Antichrist, together with the false prophet, is going to be able to, to cause people to, to keep them from buying and selling unless they, re, they receive the mark, uh, which is the worship and, the, and the, the bowing of the knee that they would worship Satan and the Antichrist. This would sound so fanciful, right, so far out there if it wasn't recorded and then listened unto. Well, how are they going to treat Jeremiah in Jeremiah's day when he comes and says to them, now it's time to submit unto the enemy, hand yourself over to the Babylonians. Could you imagine anybody standing up and saying, you, are, you should, as Americans, uh, the Russians are attacking, you should, you should yield yourselves to them. And we would say, you're crazy. Now maybe we wouldn't pick the Russians anymore, but they're as much as the enemy probably is everywhere. Maybe it's the Chinese now. I don't know, or maybe we'd pick something else. But you understand the point being that in our day and age, why is this happening? Not God's fault. It's not, these things aren't happening because God prophesied, well, God just got to fulfill prophecy, so then it's happening because it's written down. That's backwards thinking. This is happening because they had forsaken the law of the Lord, Jeremiah's day. They have not obeyed God's voice, have not walked in his ways, walked after their own evil imaginations. They obeyed the idols in their, in their own ways, and they learned that from their fathers. So if there's going to be revival in our days, revival is to come alive again. If there is going to be a move of God that, that reaches into the church and awakens them unto these, this powerful truth of the Holy Spirit is the one who brings people to Christ and to see many people who do not yet know God saved through faith in Christ Jesus in a, in a powerful way, it will be a revival of the truth of God's word. If there's going to be a revival, it will be a revival of the truth of God's word and walking in his ways. If you study the past revivals, do you know what the common ingredient is? Is when the Spirit of God comes upon the people of God, they have to get right in their personal lives with God. Whatever they've been doing in their personal lives that's not right with God, and then he starts to, in their, in their dealings with others, uh, it's said, I think, of the Welsh revivals that the bars closed because people stopped uh, partaking of drunkenness. There was one particular place in revival where all the, the stamps and envelopes had been sold at the post office because when the Spirit of God came upon the people, they had to send out their letters asking for forgiveness. And in many cases, they were sending out letters and paying off their debts because God finally got right in their hearts. And so if there's going to be a revival in our days, it will be by believing his prophetic word that it is to be fulfilled. Pretty crazy if we really understand how close could we be. Well, in many ways, the rapture of the church has no prophetic events that must take place before it. Meaning this, that Jesus can return at any moment. The doctrine of imminency, meaning the teaching that Jesus gave his disciples to be ready for him at any moment. And he's been away for almost 2,000 years. And yet he said, if I come in the third hour or the fourth hour, he says, blessed is that man who is watching. And we've been instructed to watch and pray. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, you and I should be aware, all right? And, and I want you to know this, that we should be watching and praying because the prophecies that Jesus gave concerning the signs of what would be happening in the world before his coming, they are on the, the view. You can see them. So chapter 9, verse 17, uh, Jeremiah is recording in his day, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider ye and call for the mourning women that they may come and send for cunning women that they may come. Verse 18, they're going to wail and that they're going to cry with tears. Verse 19, a voice of wailing is heard out of Zion because they're spoiled. He is simply making a prophecy that there is going to be crying and weeping. Wailing is with that, that great sound because of so much pain that's coming upon them for their disobedience. Verse 20, yet hear the word of the Lord. So as only as prophecy of judgment can do, it can prepare you to make you ready to live for the Lord in these last days. If you know that there is a judgment coming upon the world for all who have refused Jesus Christ. If you know that's coming and if that begins to affect your heart, part of your watchfulness and prayer, if you really begin to understand this, not your agony, but agonizing, not for the souls, but agonizing concerning the cross of Jesus Christ of what he paid the price in order to save souls. 
verse 20, yet hear the word of the Lord. He says, O ye women, and let not your, excuse me, and let your ear receive the word of his mouth and teach your daughters wailing. So Jeremiah is prophesying for three generations. It's not like he shows up on a weekend, gives a sermon, and everybody listens to it, and that's that. This is a span of over 50 to 60 years that he is speaking these things. Listen, I'm watching it happen. I'm watching it happen the last, happen the last 15 years. There was a rise of the awareness of the, of the return of Jesus Christ in the 80s, even in this country, but even around the world. And there was, a, there was an idea of an understanding that it could be happening in our lifetime. Israel, 1948, back as a nation, that's one of the biggest signs that has happened in the 20th century. And then to realize that there was a rise of paying attention to prophecy and it began to increase and increase. And then people were awakened to check out these prophecies of what's going to happen and what about Israel and what about the 70th week of Daniel and what about this thing called tribulation and what about the Antichrist and what about this book of Revelation. And there was so much interest going on, but you know what's happening? After all this time, it's starting to decline. And yet, this whole thing of of being able to receive these things. And so if it has taken 30 years, hey, they've been talking about this since I was a little kid. Hey, I studied this and, and they were already talking about the return of Christ. It didn't happen. I think they were wrong, so let's not talk about it anymore. That's the prevailing mindset. But here they're told to continue to listen to the Lord. Uh, verse 22, thus saith the Lord, even the carcasses of men shall fall as dung upon the open field. Now, who likes delivering this message? Now, I've been teaching through Revelation, and as I share those things, and I read about these judgments, you know, and the, that seal is opened up, and then, you know, this many people are killed on the earth. And again, future. And then to study these bold judgments, we just studied on Sunday, and, and so many of the people are tormented because they've refused to repent. It's not fun to teach. In fact, sometimes you might even understand to be sick to your stomach concerning this prophecy. Well, Concerning this, last days or last times living, the teaching of the prophecy, what, it, what in prophecy would make us cry? We're told to hear the word of the Lord and receive his word and then to teach those that come after you what is coming. I have 20 verses in my notes. Do you want them? Right? 20 verses to reveal that in the Bible it has been shown that we live in the last time. So when the Bible's written, this term last times or last days began when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And he went into heaven with the promise that he would return. He was going to prepare a place for his apostles, right, for his disciples and all who would come to faith through their testimony. And then he gave instructions of his return. And then as the Spirit wrote out the rest of the scriptures, um, I'll just pick a couple of them for you here. Here's 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Um, Revelation 3, 6, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Again, future prophetic. Isaiah 2, 2, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and nations shall flow into it. 2 Timothy 3, 1, in the last days perilous times shall come. Uh, 2 Peter 3.3, 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Jude 1.18, how then they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own godly lust. Matthew 24.5, for many shall come in my name, and again, this is Jesus talking, saying, I am the Christ and shall deceive many. 2 Thessalonians 2.3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first. And I've got 20 of these, and I had to limit what I put into my notes. What I am presenting for you tonight as we study through Jeremiah, and we're studying through Revelation on Sundays, is that when we come to the scriptures and we realize that, that we're living in a day and age in which the end of all things is about to be fulfilled, the moment that the church is raptured, God is going to set into motion, if you will, the prophetic time clock for Israel. He has seven years of unfinished prophecy to be fulfilled for his people Israel. Satan is going to have the opportunity to rule the world through his man here on earth for three and a half years. And he has been longing to be worshiped as God since he fell way before in the Garden of Eden. You study your Bible and have an understanding and would listen to the word of God. Well, in 
chapter 9, verse 23, a key verse in this section, said, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord which exercises loving kindness and judgment and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will punish them, right? And he speaks of the circumcised and the uncircumcised. He says he's going to punish the, the earth in that, in that time period with Babylon. He's going to punish the unbelievers together with the believers of Israel. So where is the glorying in prophecy? Is it in a man's understanding and wisdom? And, you know, this guy really understands it and he writes a book. Hey, when a guy gets up and writes a book and sells millions of dollars worth of books, you know what I do with that? I just sit back and I watch the effect of that book upon the body of Christ. I watch how many people fall for these things that he, this guy is writing about. He's like, this guy is the great teacher and he's got all these things. There comes a point in time that this understanding, where is the glorying? It's only glorying and knowing and understanding the Lord. In all of our studies and all of our things that we're giving ourselves to do, the result should be that we know the Lord better. We understand his righteousness, his judgment. We understand his loving kindness. We understand his patience. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.26, uh, excuse me, one twenty nine. no flesh should glory in his presence. No flesh should glory in his presence. And so he's saying in Jeremiah's day, and it's true now today. What is the real effect that's happening in the church? Well, I think we have a few, or maybe a lot, who are now glorying in their might, their riches, and their own understanding. We love the day and age of the superstar pastor, if you will. <coughs> superstar worship leaders. Hey, if you don't think that's not happening, go online and see what's there, and you'll find this out. So, in Christ Jesus, this is the way we are to live. This, this is what this comes down to. Chapter 10, as we wrap up here tonight, we find out, uh, verse 1, Hear ye the word of the Lord, speak what, it, what the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismay, dismayed at the signs of heaven. Do you mean to tell me that in that day that people were looking for signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, even now, we should not be shaken when a man writes a book about the four blood moons. Remember that, again, a year ago, and that this is going to be the end of the world, and, and these things are all going to line up, and, and then the guy gives these signs. We're not to be dismayed by them. You'll find out that in Jeremiah's day, he's speaking the same thing. He talks about the customs of the people are vain in verse 3, and, and then describes the idolatry and the evil, and you shouldn't be afraid of those things. So the worldliness of God's people is addressed by Jeremiah, and then in Ephesians 4, 17, we're told not to walk as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. What's the greatest threat in this day and age concerning what's happening in the church? Right? That falling away of the faith, the greatest threat is that we're walking in the way of the heathen and that which the unbelievers do in the way uh, those of, of a darkened and alienated uh, mind and alienated from the life of God through ignorance, the blindness of their heart, is that the church is actually following the ways of the ungodly. If you study it out, and maybe you didn't know this, but you do need to know this, that the same effective working model of how to get corporations to grow and increase their influence and money and wealth and shape the global environment, that same philosophy of teaching has been brought into the church the same way, and you know what? they discovered those that were actively trying to work through corporations said, they're not going to change this fast enough. We need another vehicle which to change the global outlook of the world. And you know what they chose? They chose the church. And they brought men in with teachers and, and they wrote books. And those books went wildly popular. And if you peel back, you know, it's kind of like The Wizard of Oz. Right? And you go and peel back the curtain and you just find out there's just a, a man behind this curtain. And all those things of Oz were not real. He couldn't do any of those things. And you realize that which you peel back, the worldliness has infected the church. And the whole philosophies that are, that are business and successful is the same model that's been presented in the church. Verse 6, um, For as much there is none unlike to the Lord, none, none like unto thee, O Lord, now, here we are. And if we can 
hold to one thing, that the main thing should be the main thing, is that there is no one like Jesus Christ. There is no one like God Almighty. There is no one like the Lord, the, the I am, the, the all-existing one, the one who forever has existed and always will exist. There is no one like him. And that's, uh, you find out that's the prophecy. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain. Uh, for as much as among all the wise men of all the nations and all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. They are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of va vanities. Silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish. Gold from Uphaz, the work of the workman and the work of the hands of the founder. Blue and purple is their clothing. They are all the work of cunning men, but the Lord is the true God. Verse 10, the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. Now this was echoed in the days when Moses is standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with Pharaoh and the miraculous plagues are being played out for Pharaoh to, to get him to let the people of God go. Uh, Exodus 8, 10, and that, that whole phrase, who may know that, that who is like unto the Lord our God. When, they're, when they get to the other side of the, of the Red Sea when it parts, 15, 11, who is like unto thee, O Lord God? God has given us a task to display the banner here because of the truth. We as a church, with understanding of knowing who the Lord is, are not into all the being successful and use this and this and all these different models and, and they're, they're all out there and there's church growth seminars. They have been the most widely popular things for the last 30 years, how to have your mega church. Now I encourage you, true to form with verse 10, the Lord is the true God, the living God, everlasting king, his wrath at his wrath, the earth shall tremble. The nations shall not be able to abide in his indignation. He is glorious in holiness. He's fearful in praises, doing wonders. The true God, he's the living God. He's the everlasting king. Wrath and indignation are upon the nations. What is that banner that we display? That Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. And he's the son of the living God. Caddy Corner from here if you're from out east or Kitty Corner if you grew up in the Midwest, right over here is a whole group of people under a different religion bowing down five times a day to another God towards the direction of a city where there's this rock over there, what they call their foundational rock, which is the foundation of the earth. Not true, but they teach it that way. And they bow down five times a day that they have to be good at their, their religion and they do not have the Son of God. They don't believe in the Son of God. They don't have life, they have no forgiveness of sin, and they're not alone. And you can go around the globe and you can find that. And all those things that were formerly just in certain places are all now scattered everywhere in this world. What do we find out? Listen to John, 1 John 5, 20. I have it here in my notes. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. That is the witness and testimony of after having lived as an eyewitness together with Jesus Christ, saw all of his miracles, John writes down in his gospel and he wrote his gospel in such a way that you would know that Jesus is the Christ and that you, through faith in him you could have life everlasting. And as he writes it in that way, and here we are now, in the last times, the last of the last times, when the signs that Jesus said would be being fulfilled, we hold to that, that one simple thing, that Jesus is the Son of God which come down from heaven and he's the true God and he is the one to be worshipped. Now, it's been said of Jesus Christ, don't leave earth without him. Whether you die or whether you're here for the, the punishment and the, the end and destruction of all things, do you know him? Do you know the one true God? Well, all the way down, uh, 11 through 20 speaks of God as the creator of the heavens and the earth. Here is the biggest challenge. To search and seek out the accounting of the origins with an open and honest heart and to find out who has revealed the beginning of all things and what has revealed those things and what is true. And that's the real challenge in Jeremiah's day, 11 through 20. And you find out that every man is brutish in his knowledge, verse 14. Every man became brutish in his knowledge, so much so that even the pastors, the shepherds in verse 21, 
who they are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. It used to be, well, at least the pastors believe in God. And now what's the truth? Is that many who are now called pastors, they themselves don't believe in the word of God as the word of God. Now, I'd sort of leave us with this. Uh, verse 23, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. What is the real religion of this world? It's humanism. The real religion is mankind will evolve into enlightened beings. and That's the real religion of this world. And yet the truth is, is who created man? And that's the issue of can mankind walk in his own ways? Jeremiah declares, O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. So if the pastors who are to lead the people to the Lord Jesus, the good shepherd, have not sought the Lord and become brutish, they become insensible, stupid, unfeeling, savage, ferocious, brutal, gross, carnal, bestial, ignorant, uncivilized, untaught. Another de different, uh, dictionary definition said carnal and sensual. You mean to tell me that someone would come and turn this gospel of Jesus Christ into something different? You mean that there would be others who would come that even if an angel come and preaches a different gospel or a different Jesus, Paul could boldly say, let him be accursed? Well, where does this leave you and I? So you got all the bad news in Jeremiah 9 and 10. It's not over. You can look at prophecy and you can look at, wow, I don't want to read Revelation because it makes me stick to, sick to my stomach. I don't want to hear all those bad things that are coming because I want to feel good. I want to have a nice day. Or you can say what? Who is wise and understanding among us who will listen to what God says and then declare it to others. My encouragement to you, as believers in Christ Jesus, remember your relationship with the truth. If you're not yet a believer having received new life in Christ Jesus, you don't have a relationship with God makes you sure you go to heaven when you die. That's the real consideration. Is the Bible true concerning how you can be saved from sin and death? Is the cross of Jesus Christ the answer for forgiveness of sin? And did the resurrection of Jesus Christ actually take place? And is he alive forevermore and is he in heaven? And to discover and seek out that knowledge of the Lord in truth, is he coming again? And if he's coming again, what's he going to do? Well, what should God do for this world that's been killing one another? What should God do for this world who has refused to turn from their sins and follow Jesus Christ? Well, as tonight as you remember your relationship with the truth, I send you one place in your scriptures, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2.8, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead? You believe that the 500 who saw him at one time, their eyewitness account is true. 1 Corinthians 15 records 500 people saw him alive, so he appeared. And you know what? Study history. The Roman government killed 200 of those 500 simply to try to stop what was happening concerning those who taught to follow the one who had risen from the dead. And you know what? Not a single one of those 200 could deny that they had seen Jesus Christ risen from the dead. 2 Timothy 2, verse 14. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing this word of truth. Do you understand that as a believer you have a relationship with the truth and this, the prophecy and all the effect of this, uh, 2 Timothy 2.18. Speaking of those who had erred from the, the way of following Jesus Christ, he names him by name in verse 17, Hymenius and Philetus. He says, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. You mean to tell me that there were false prophets and prophesying and saying the day of the Lord had come way back in Paul's day? Yes. So we can understand that this relationship that we have with the truth and that the prophetic word is going to be fulfilled. Now, when I sat 
in my first Bible study of a man teaching what he had been taught concerning the 70th week of Daniel and giving prophecy of the what is going to happen for Israel and prophecy concerning that the Antichrist would come and prophecy that Jesus Christ in his second coming at the end of that seven year time period that the Lord Jesus would return in his second coming. And I saw the detailed accounting of what God had written down, given to Daniel, right? Daniel's almost a contemporary with Jeremiah. He comes right after him. 2,500 year old prophecy yet to be fulfilled and I had to make a consideration of the truth. You know what I thought? I'm gonna tell all my friends that I played volleyball with, I was living up in Grand Forks, I had, I had my group of friends and I'm talking with them about the Lord and it says, you need to be saved from sin and death and I was talking to them about their lives and about their lives apart from God and I, was, I said, don't you wanna be saved from sin and death? I came across this thing called prophecy in the Bible, you know what I thought? I'm gonna tell them this information and they're gonna be so blown away like I was concerning what God had showed was going to happen, concerning the things he had already given would take place, that God has revealed he is the one who has given all these words of prophecy, I thought for sure they're going to get saved. And I shared all this information with the same zeal that I have right now, and I'm like, you've got to look at this, and I'm opening up the Bible, and they, and they said, so? Not understanding the truth that was put right before their eyes. Do you love the Lord Jesus? I mean, this is, do you love the Lord? Now, I know that if you love someone, you obey them. Think of a, a, a friendship. Jesus said unto his disciples, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. And then he instructed them to obey his commands. If you have a friend and you know what your friend's will is, what do you do because you love your friend? You do what they want you to do. I don't know if any of you on purpose would say, my friend wants it done this way, but I'm gonna do it the other way so I can just, I can wreck their lives. Jesus has called us friends. He's left us here on the earth and he said that we are to be his ambassadors here on earth. And we come to this understanding, this prophetic word which Jeremiah was writing about, you and I are to remember our relationship with the truth. Because is truth dead? Is truth gone? My answer to you, uh-uh. We have the word of God that Jesus, the Son of God, is true. Haven't you heard people lie to you and say to you, oh, we're all serving the same God, just different expressions of the same God. All roads lead to heaven. Haven't you heard people talk like that? And yet, the Bible has revealed that only one is true. And Jesus said this of himself, that he is the way, he is the truth, and he's the life. Father in heaven,